Hey everybody, welcome to the Elevate Talk Show. I am your host, Deanna Johnson Coffin. And I'm Adriana Coffin, your co-host. And we're the mother-daughter talk show that's here to elevate your family. If you haven't done so already, please take a second to like this video and to subscribe so that you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. Well, uh, we are in the month of April and we, the Elevate Talk Show, just celebrated this past week our one year uh, anniversary as a show and we are super super excited about that and as a way to celebrate we have designated the month of April as Celebrate Elevate, the Celebrate Elevate month and so during this month of April we are going to give a shout out to some of our subscribers who have supported us and helped us um, succeed as a show over the past year uh, and so we want to give a shout out to Lawanda Johnson, to Deborah McLaughlin, to Junior Barrow, uh, to Wilkes, uh, Ruth Wilkes, to Nicole Doyle, and to Darren Butler Sr. Just a few more of the people who have subscribed and who have viewed and who have shared the show. We do not take that for granted. We just want to thank you for being our supporters. Uh, and as a, a little show of support, a little show of, um, of our love to you, we want to go ahead and send you one of our Elevate um, show refrigerator magnets as a thank you gift. So we're going to be sending that out in the mail to you as soon as possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing to the show. Um, Adriana is going to give us a brief overview of what we're going to see today. Yes, so in our Around the Town segment, we're going to be taking you to Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. In our Perspective segment, we're going to be telling, talking about what you should consider if you're thinking about becoming an adoptive or foster parent. Mm -hmm. And in our Continuing the Conversation segment, my mom is going to sit down with Erica Kaufman, the Program Director at Chris 180, who shares about how her organization helps heal and strengthen families and build community. Yes, yes, and you want to be sure to stay tuned for our meal of the week segment with Adriana. She's going to show you how to make these delicious sweet chili chicken wings. We actually had them for lunch today. They were just yummy for your tummy. So you want to stay tuned for that. We need to take a little break. Don't go away. We'll be back. And today's topic is on the subject of foster care um, and, you know, what it is and, you know, and just uh, some of our thoughts about foster care, not that we have fostered a child ourselves. Uh, and so um, the question is, what is foster care? And um, and you know and what uh, what are what experiences if any have we had with that? And foster care is basically where the system where um, um, the local powers that be defects or whatever they're called in whatever in whatever state you happen to be in has to come in for whatever reason to um, take a child from their birth home or birth parents because of trauma or drama or some sort of, um, you know, negligence um, and that child has to be cared for by the state because something bad has happened um, at home. So that's basically what foster care is. Um, and so I remember, um, as far as my own personal experience with foster care, I remember growing up in New York City, Queens, New York, and our family having a foster care child in our home for a period of time. I was young. Um, my brothers, my two brothers were older. They're six and seven years older than me or seven and eight years older than me. So I would have been, I don't know, maybe seven or eight. I was young. I was maybe even six or seven. But I remember, I believe his name was Leroy, um, him living with us. And for me, he was just one of our brothers, my brothers. I had two biological brothers and then there was Leroy and I think Leroy would might have been with us a couple of years it was a while um, and I remember uh, after a while had passed Leroy 
leaving our family. We were told that he was going to be leaving us. And I remember just crying and crying because Leroy was going to, was, had to leave us. I believe he was being reunited with his um, birth family, with his biological family, which is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but at, when you're six or seven years old and someone leaves your family, you don't think of it as a good thing. No. You, it, it just seems like, well, you're losing a loved one. Yeah. So I remember that was that was my own personal experience with foster care. Um, but we, as a family and as a in our in our church family, we had an opportunity in the last couple of years to. Uh, do some stuff with kids in foster care. Share about that. Yes, so we have a neighbor who lives across the street from us who works at a school where the majority of the students are in foster care situations mm -hmm. and a lot of them didn't have some of the like hygiene and other supplies that they needed mm -hmm. so our church um, had a a toiletry hygiene drive and we donated a bunch of stuff to the school yeah and they were um it was such a blessing it was a blessing for them but it was a blessing for us too um after we made the donation and i and uh talked with my neighbor she just uh shared how um how blessed and and how um happy um and how um you know just the kids and the teachers really felt loved on and cared for by those things and they made these cards these big gigantic cards and everybody signed off on it including kids and teachers yeah. just to say how thankful and grateful they were it was i mean they were blessed but we were really really blessed too um by the experience you know um to be able to come alongside as a community and help these kids in this small way um, and so it's um it was um it was an eye-opening experience yeah and so for us um, we're gonna get to continue this conversation about foster care and adoptions with um, uh, Erica Kaufman Erica Kaufman is the program director over the foster care and adoptions um, placement at an organization called life um, I'm sorry, not life. It is called, um, what is it called? Chris 180. Chris, I'm sorry, Chris 180. Uh, and so we had a, um in-depth conversation about adoption and about um, foster care. So we need to take a break, but we'll be back with that interview in just a moment. Don't go away. Conversation segment. My mom is going to be air interviewing Erica Kaufman, the director of the Chris 180 program. Yes, uh, Erica is the program director of the foster care and adoption um, uh, system part of the Chris 180, and we sat down and have a, and had a conversation about uh, foster care, what that looks like, and the needs of the kids, and how parents, how people can become foster care parents and or adoptive parents. So please turn your attention to my interview with Erica Kaufman. So CHRIS 180, CHRIS is an acronym. It stands for Creativity, Honor, Respect, Integrity, and Safety. Uh -huh. And CHRIS 180 uh, has mental health at the core of everything that we do. Wow. So whether that's from our mental health centers that are across at the at Metro Atlanta area, uh -huh. to our school-based mental health services, to providing housing for youth and families experiencing homelessness, to foster care and adoptions. Mm -hmm. We help families, children, adults, and communities move through their trauma to experience better lives. Wow, wow, That's that sounds like um, quite a, uh, a calling. Uh, you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's wonderful. We need more organizations like you. Thank y'all for doing what you do. Um, now you are the program director for adoptions and foster care, Chris 180. What does a typical day look like for you? If there is a typical day? Um, that's a great question. There really isn't a typical day. It's yeah. different every day, which is wow. part of what I love about my job. Oh, wow. Um, so I could be working directly with children and families, doing home visits, visiting the children in their houses to make sure everything is going smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, I could be supervising staff to make mm -hmm. sure that they are parenting correctly and supporting our families to the best of their ability. Wow. We have specialists, which is what we call our case managers mm -hmm. that are on call to our families 24-7. Wow. Um, and they just provide wraparound services, meaning they wrap the family in support 
Mm-hmm. Um, or I could be doing what I do most is accepting referrals from DFACS, the Division wow. of Family and Children's Services yes. for foster care and adoptive placements. Wow. Well, so you, that's a question that I didn't ask, but I'm very curious about that. So you guys work in conjunction with DFACS? Yes. Okay. Wow. That's great. But just you all are just the private side of things. Um, we're called a, we're a CPA, which is a child placing agency. Okay. Which means all the children in our care are in the custody of DFACS. Oh, really? Okay. So that's how that works. I was very curious about how that works. Thank you for clearing that up for me. So now, um, how does, can you explain what happens to land a child in foster care? It seems like that would, something traumatic obviously has to happen, but tell me about what, what has to happen for a kid to get into foster care, into the foster care system. Sure. So it is, it is traumatic. Um, just the act of coming into foster care and leaving your original family, your birth family is traumatic in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but what happens is someone out there sees something that's going wrong with a child. Yeah. They suspect abuse or neglect has happened and they report it to DFACS. Okay. And then DFACS has their due diligence to go out and investigate the situation. And right. if they determine that maltreatment has happened, then they yes. take the child into their custody and try and find an appropriate home for them. Wow. Okay. But you would think that, so it's not necessarily a one-time, well, I guess, depending on the situation, it could be, but seems like there would have to be, uh, I guess, and that's where defects comes in and vets the situation, that it would have to be more than just, you know, you leaving the child home by themselves one time and, you know, somebody finding out about that. I mean, because otherwise a lot of people could be <laughs> in foster care, you know, well, I'm just thinking, about that process. I'm assuming that it's been, it's, they, they look at the situations and there's definitely been um, a history of bad treatment here. It depends on the situation. So something that DFACS can do is in-home services. Yes. So they can keep the child in the home and then support the bio family through case management services and referring them out to mental health and things oh, of wow. that nature. Uh-huh. Um, the goal of DFACS is always to keep families together. Wow. So even when a child comes into foster care, the first goal is always reunification back to the bio family. Really? Okay. So that is, still, they're not just snatching the child and saying, okay, we're done with them. Uh, we're done with the bio. Okay. But right. that's very interesting. I think it's so um, good that you're clearing up some of these myths uh, because mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Um, very good. So now what, um, what does a person need to do if they want to become a foster parent, somebody like me or my neighbor or um, my friends from church, what does someone do if they want to become a foster parent? Yeah. Yeah. So there's two sides to that coin. Um, The first would be the paperwork side. So you have to be at least 10 years older than the child that you want to foster in your home. Okay. You have to be able to pass a CPS and background check Mm -hmm. and you have to go through a variety of trainings with us. Oh, wow. Um, And then the other side of the coin is you just have to have a heart and the ability to care for the children who need it. So some people come to foster care and they just want to care for little infants and babies. Um, But across the state of Georgia, the greatest need is actually for teenagers and sibling groups. Really? I was going to ask that. So older children and multiples. Wow. 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 Yeah. yeah. So they are the ones who uh, need care the most. Um, so now um, what do they need to do? Um, what about adoption? I would imagine that that process is even more complicated if you want to. Um, I wouldn't to say it's more complicated. It is a bit more thorough. Okay. So both to become a foster or adoptive family, mm-hmm. the first thing you need to do with Chris 180 is go through an orientation session. Mm-hmm. And that's where we talk all about our history as an organization, mm-hmm. what you need to do to become a foster or adoptive parent, and what it would look like to have a child placed in your home. Wow. So if you want to become an adoptive parent, you can do that two ways. The yes. first is called foster to adopt. Yes. Where you foster a child first. Yes. And then if their permanency plan becomes adoption, yes. DFAC should ask you first if you want to be the adoptive resource for that child or children. Wow. Okay. So it's just, it's, it's the next step in, it's possibly the next step in the process. You force a child first, and then you decide, I think I may want to make this child a permanent part of our family. Right. That's one way to do it. The other way is if you only want to adopt. So we have families that come to us and say that foster care isn't for them. It's too hard to love a child in their home and then um, give them back to their family. Yeah. which is understandable. Sure. So 
we have families that come to us and just want to do what we call pure adoption. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's the same as foster care where you do an orientation, you have to pass some background checks. You have to do what's called a home study, Mm -hmm. um, which is a requirement of all child placing agencies in the state of Georgia, where we do an interview process and we talk about why do you want to adopt? Who do you want to adopt? Mm -hmm. Um, what's your experience with children and just making sure that you're a good fit for this population. Sure. Sure. That's, it sounds very thorough and time consuming, which it should be. I mean, you're right. talking about people's lives, both the child's life and the and the adopted the potential adoptive family's life. So let's talk about the um, what a day looks like for, and I and this may be sort of hard to answer, but you will will kind of just work with it until um, and see. Um, what does day look like for a child in foster care? I've never been in foster care. I've never had. I mean, you know, like I said, other than uh, my experience. Uh, as a child having um, a foster care kid in our home for a period of time. That's, that's, my, that's the breadth of my experience with that. What is life like for a kid in foster care? So life for a kid in foster care is really similar to a child who's not in foster care. Okay. So they still wake up in the home of a loving family. Yes. They still brush their teeth, get ready for school, interact with teachers and peers, come home and do their homework, have a family meal, and then fall asleep in a home of people who love and care for them. What's different is the oversight. So we have a lot of people who are assigned by the state to make sure that that child is in the best home for them possible Mm -hmm. and that their foster or adoptive parents are caring for them in the most appropriate way. So we have our specialists at Chris 180 who Mm -hmm. come out twice a month and they do um, interviews separately with every household member and they make sure that everything is going as well as it could be. And if not, what can we do to make the situation better? How can we wrap the family in support? How can we ensure that this is the best situation that it can be for the child at this um, specific Mm -hmm. moment in time? And then the state has people who do the same thing. That wow. come out and check on the child regularly. Wow. So layers of uh, what do you call of checks and balances, it sounds like. Yes. Layers. That's great. That's great. So now you I want to circle back to something you talked about earlier about kids in the system. The greatest need for foster parents was is with older kids and with kids uh, who have multiple, well, multiple siblings. Um, and so do kids with that being said, I would imagine that some kids age out of the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that, so you, so you basically, you effectively end up with no family. Um, That's never the plan. So once a child turns 14, Mm -hmm. they become part of what's called an independent living program Okay, where they are required every month. Mm -hmm. They're required every month to Mm -hmm. have trainings from the state about how to become an effective and safe adult. Really? So Part of that is something called round tables, yes. round table discussions, mm-hmm. where you meet with the child and their support team, whatever their support team looks like and whoever they want to be there. Yes. And they make sure that we're planning for when they age out of the system or when they become adopted or when they turn 18, what they want to do, if they want to sign themselves back into care for a few years wow. so that they can go through college while still being supported by a family Yes. or if they feel like they have the skills necessary to be independent. Welcome back to the Family Talk Show. Now we're going to take you around the town to one of my favorite places in Atlanta, Piedmont Park. Piedmont Park is, um, is uh, all things Atlanta. Uh, you know, um, it's got all the flavors of a big city. You'll see... Uh, everything and anything at Piedmont Park. Everything and anything. Yeah, we've including... certainly seen some stuff. We've seen uh, several different park poets. Yes. Uh, there have been several people who were just in the park quoting poetry, some poetry that they've read, others that they've composed yeah. themselves. And yeah, and I mean, we you know, were it's uh, interesting. very, very interesting. We had, we had one guy approach us, and it was all good. Uh, we were sort of... Um, we were, I think we were the only ones that were his audience at that yeah. moment, but it was all good. But there's so much more to see uh, at Piedmont Park. There's the wide open green space. Um, it's a great place to play. Yeah. Um, it's a great place to picnic. It's a great place for the arts because um, lots of um, 
um, various different festivals come to Piedmont Park. Just a great place to go, uh, especially now that spring and summer is uh, back, and even when the pandemic was on, because we were we went during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, great place to just be outdoors, socially distanced. Not that we have to worry about that as much, but still, um, just a, a wonderful place to uh, discover. Um, and, and, you know, just create your own adventure. So, please turn your attention to our adventures at Piedmont Park. This week, the Elevate Talk Show takes you around the town to Piedmont Park, located about one mile northeast of downtown Atlanta, between the Midtown and Virginia Highland neighborhoods. The land, originally owned by Dr. Benjamin Walker and used as his farm and residence, was later used as an exposition space by the Piedmont Exposition Company. The stone balustrades scattered around the park once held steps leading to the major building built for the 1895 Cotton States and International Exposition. The park, which is home to Lake Clara Mir, located in the southeast part of the premises, offers spectacular views as it perfectly mirrors the Atlanta skyline. When visiting the park, make sure to also take in views of the lake from the walking bridge that was added during the 2002 renovation of the lake. Piedmont Park is also a popular venue for various annual celebrations and events, including the Atlanta Dogwood Festival, which celebrated its 100th year anniversary back in 2016. Piedmont Park is well known for organized and intramural sports. The park also contains several miles of paved path suitable for walking, running, inline skating, and cycling. Piedmont Park, which originally had a bathhouse that opened in 1911, received a multi-million dollar renovation in 2008 and now has a state-of-the-art pool complex. Even though the park is located in the middle of a bustling metropolis, it is home to a host of wildlife, including a variety of birds, as well as to turtles and other amphibians. You never know who you might meet when you're walking around the park. While we were there, we met an aspiring spoken word artist who gave us a sample of his poetry. Piedmont Park represents some of the best outdoor space that Atlanta has to offer and has a variety of activities for the whole family. For more information about Piedmont Park, visit www.piedmontpark.org. Well, we hope that you enjoyed our adventures at Piedmont Park. We certainly enjoyed being there and sharing, and sharing that time with you. We need to take a break. Don't go away. We'll be back. I'm going to be showing you how to make sweet chili chicken wings, which is a really easy, flavorful recipe. Yeah, yeah, it's got, had a little kick, not too terribly much. Adriana tends to like more of the spicy, savory type of foods yeah um but so but just enough kick to make it interesting and it was very flavorful it was finger looking looking good i'm gonna say that i have no shame in my game as far as licking my fingers are concerned no 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 shame in my game just um quick and fun and easy yeah uh and delicious of course so please turn your attention to adriana's sweet chili chicken wings <laughs> hello and welcome to the meal of the week segment Today, I'm going to be showing you how to make a really easy sweet chili wings recipe. So let's get started. Okay, so we're going to start off by seasoning our wings. So I have um, some fresh chicken wings that I got from the store, and I cut them in half so that you have flats and drumettes. But if you want to just keep them whole, that's fine too. So I'm going to take some salt. some black pepper, and some garlic powder. I'm just going to put all of those on our wings. And I'm going to do the other half over here, just some salt, some black pepper,
and some garlic powder. And now that we've got the wings seasoned, I'm going to put them in a 400 degree oven for uh, about 45 minutes and then I'll be back to show you the rest of the recipe. All right, so now the wings are almost ready, so we're going to work on our sweet chili sauce while we're waiting for them to finish up. So I'm going to add in half a cup of butter and I'm just going to let that melt. And then I'm going to add in two teaspoons of red pepper flakes, two teaspoons of garlic powder, and two tablespoons of chili powder. So I'm just going to stir that together and I'm just going to let this melt and let the spices cook for a couple of minutes. All right, so now that the butter is fully melted, I'm going to add in half a cup of sugar. And I'm just going to stir that around until the sugar has fully dissolved into the rest of the ingredients. All right, so our sauce is done. And now I'm going to take out our wings and I'll show you the rest of the recipe. All right, so our sweet chili sauce is done. Our wings are done. So now I'm going to toss the wings into the sauce. So I'm just going to take our wings and transfer them to this bowl. And now I'm going to add in our sweet chili sauce. So I'm just going to take that from the pot. I'm going to put this into our bowl. in the sauce and make sure that every wing gets some of the sauce on it so that they're all nice and flavorful. Okay, I'm going to plate this up and give you a close-up shot so that you can see how good this looks. is Celebrate with Elevate Month. So if you haven't done so already, please celebrate um, our one year anniversary with us by becoming a subscriber. Just go to our YouTube channel page and hit the subscribe button and then you'll be reminded of all of our upcoming episodes. That's right. And when you subscribe, we will send out to you one of our new Elevate uh, talk show refrigerator magnets. This way you can put this on your fridge and whenever you see us uh, you'll think about the show hopefully and uh, you'll share it with your friends and you'll watch um, some of our upcoming episodes, right? Yeah. So just subscribe to the show, leave your info in the comment sec uh, segment uh, section of the show and we will send one of these right out to you ASAP. If you're going to tell our viewers how they can watch us, where they can go to watch us. Well, we upload new episodes to our YouTube channel every week. You can also catch us on DeKalb County, Georgia's Public Access Channel 25 on Sundays at 7 o'clock p.m. Mm -hmm. Or you can live stream us at DeKalb25.com on Sundays at 7 p.m. too. Absolutely. So lots of ways to catch us, right? Yeah. That's right. Well, we want to thank you, thank you, thank you again for being uh, one of our subscribers, our viewers watching the show. We don't take that for granted. Thank you uh, for tuning in 